start with a little humor of our own this morning. So if you'd go ahead and put that cartoon up. Take a moment there to look at it. For, for those of you that may listen to this later on audio, I'll tell you what it says. That's Di and I sitting on the couch. And she looks at me and says, I think you need a hearing test. And I'm responding, why in the heck do I need a hairy chest? Well, I should give full disclosure here. About two years ago, I did take a hearing test at the insistence of my lovely wife uh, because of certain issues. Uh, I passed with flying colors. Now, but I don't know, husband, should have I told her I passed or should have I told her I failed? I, I may have messed up because I told her I passed. And so I've been paying the price ever since. Well, Fresh Hearing, we're in a series entitled Fresh. We're looking at perspectives uh, on various topics in the Bible that may give you a little bit different slant. Today, we'll look at hearing because I believe hearing is absolutely vital. Hearing from the Lord is absolutely vital to you being an effective Christian and walking in the fullness of what God has in store. So, with that in mind, let's pray and then we'll jump in. Father, you are the best. You're the speaking God. You have spoken from time beginning, and you'll speak through all eternity. We're asking you open our ears and speak to us today, tomorrow, on into the rest of our lives, that we would partner with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have had a hearing problem in the past. Let me explain. In 1977, I was out driving in my car, southern Illinois, working with some financial planning clients. Diane and I's lives were really different back 40-some years ago. She was teaching school. I was doing the finance job. We had no kids. I was pretty happy about it. She was miserable. We went and saw doctors all the time, surgeries, always got bad news. Uh, our options were about out. And I was driving around Southern Illinois thinking about our next trip to the doctor, and um, I just was not really thinking of anything specific. But just so you're aware, at that time, we didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit, and I didn't know God spoke other than through maybe the Bible if he ever spoke. I actually never thought about it. So on that particular day 40 years ago, I'm driving along, and our lives were changed forever. Out of the blue, I hear a voice, and I don't know if it was audible or not, but it basically said, on your last doctor appointment, you're going to get very bad news, but don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. I'm not sure why I thought it was from God, but I just instantly said, that had to be God speaking to me. I, I got home, I told Diane, you're not gonna believe this, but God spoke to me today. I told her what he said, and she kind of shrugged her shoulders, rolled her eyes, and said, well, if God's gonna speak to anybody, it'd be her, not me. <laughs> After I was deflated, I thought, well, okay, you know, maybe that's true. But in less than two weeks, the doctor delivered the very statement that I had told her he was going to say, and we meet the Holy Spirit, we get filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, a few weeks after that, everything changes, our bucket list changes, everything revolves around that one hearing, one time. Our lives were changed, we obviously ended up to have five kids, everything turned out really well. But 44 years later, I would say, my life, Diane's life, our life together has been so exciting because we've heard God over and over and over. Now remember, just 10 years prior to 1977, I'm a party person at U of I, not even thinking about God. Five years before 1977, I'm a Christian that doesn't know about the Holy Spirit or that God speaks. God changed me that much that I went from sort of in the deep hole to believing he talks all the time. That's part of what I want to help, help you with today. I want you to know that God wants to speak to you. In fact, he's fanatic about it. He wants to change your ear so that you hear what he's saying over and over and over. You know, it's so precious to hear anything from God. I'll, I'll give some prophetic words a little later in the service, but isn't it always interesting when you hear anything from God has your name on it? Your, your chest just swells up a little bit. Like, Wow. He found me on planet Earth with all these billions of people running around. He knows my name, and he has something good to say about me. See, here's the dilemma, though. Right now, some of you are saying, I don't know how to hear God's voice. Others are saying, I've been so bad, why would God ever talk to me? Or I don't hear a thing, or 
I don't know what's wrong, but it doesn't ever work for me. I'm just far from God. Of course, it's a learning process. Those of you who are married or have a long-term friendship with somebody, you don't know the voice very well at first, but eventually you hear that voice really well. And husbands get so good at it, they know which ones you have to really listen to, which ones you can ignore, and don't cross those up. <laughs> you, you'll pay for it the rest of your life. So out of my 50 years of experience as a Christian, I'm going to teach you some things today about hearing from God. Now, that's my desire, but that's even more God's desire. He is deeply, deeply in love with you, and he wants to talk to you on a regular basis. So... I said our God is a speaking God, but did you know not everybody believes that? I'll give you an example. A few years ago, 2018, our then Vice President, Mike Pence, this is not a political statement, but I think you'll enjoy it. He was on a TV talk show, and the hostess asked him if he was a Christian. He said, yes. He said, well, does God speak to you? And he boldly said, yes, God speaks to me. Now, pause for a moment. Put yourself in a t national TV talk show and you, somebody says, does God speak to you? Would you say yes or no? Yes. Well, good. I'm, some of you would say yes. But here's what she went on and said. She laughed. She called him mentally ill, crazy, and deranged. That's a feeling out there. That, and it's like, I think, what do you mean you don't hear voices? I hear voices. Well, you're crazy, mentally ill, deranged. Okay, if that's what it takes, call me what you want. I want to hear voices, all right? So it, you know, it kind of comes with the territory. Now, God says something far different. I'm going to read to you from John chapter 10 in just a moment, but it describes Jesus as a shepherd. Now, shepherds want the best for their flocks. I raised sheep. I raised championship sheep as a kid. I love my sheep. I took care of them. I knew their names. I knew their faces. Do you know every sheep has a different face? You, you can recognize them by their face. It, it's just, they walk different. They act different. Everyone's unique. But I loved them. I wanted to make champions out of them. I pampered them. I did all kinds of things for them. Okay, now, I'm a human being that can't do all things. But Jesus said, I'm the shepherd. And listen to how he describes what he wants to do as he walks among us and cares for our needs. John chapter 10, verse 3. The gatekeeper, in this case, that's God, opens the gate. He let Jesus into planet Earth, so to speak. The sheep recognize his voice, and they come to him. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. After he's gathered his own flock, he walks ahead, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They run from him because they don't know his voice. Verse 16, I have other sheep too. They're not of this sheepfold and I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and will be one flock with one shepherd. Verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, they follow me. Sounds to me like a broken record. Five times he says, my sheep know my voice. Doesn't say we can or maybe we could. He says they do. They hear it. See, he wants good things. That's what shepherds do for sheep. They take care of them. They love them. They care about them. a shepherd in the days of Jesus. His whole livelihood depended on taking care of those sheep. He better take care of those sheep if he wants to survive another day. So, again, that's the opinion God has of everything. Now, again, we have an actual living God, which is unique in the terms of Bible times. In the Old Testament, lots of gods made of a wood or stone or gold or something was a non-talking God. In the New Testament, and today we, we don't have those kinds of idols, but we have wood, uh, instead of wood, we have uh, like gold, power, looks, money. Those things are idols. They don't talk either, but they create a lot of noise, don't they? They create a lot of noise. Now, if you were to think about this God speak, of course, the whole Bible's about him speaking. Genesis, he created the worlds. Noah's told to build an ark. Moses told to lead the people out. You, you go on to Jericho. A guy named Joshua is told to march around the city seven times. David, pick up five smooth stones. You got an enemy out there. You need to take him down. The prophets in the Old Testament heard God speak about a day that was coming. There'd be a new king, a new heart, a new way of living. All right? That's all God speaking. All the stories of the Old Testament, God speaking. How about the New Testament? There's Mary and Joseph, the parents of Jesus. They heard that from angels. Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. Jesus himself heard the Father speak. That's my son. I'm well pleased with him. That's my beloved son. 
See, it just goes on and on and on about how people hear from God. And so I think it's important that we keep in mind he didn't stop speaking even when the Bible stopped. He speaks today. In fact, I'd make a wager that every one of you have heard from God at least a half a dozen times today. That doesn't mean you heard, but he spoke to you. Let's let's say it this way. He spoke to you half a dozen times or more today. So why don't we hear? Well, there's two issues that are real key in hearing. One is the Bible. The other is the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, for instance, I have all kinds of verses I've memorized. When I'm in need or want, I think, okay, what does God say about when we're in need? Well, Psalm 23, verse 5 says, my cup overflows. So if I need the ability to forgive, I need finances, I need healing, I need leadership principles, he's going to overflow my cup. See, I've spent time in the Bible. Every day I read my one-year Bible. It's it's life-giving. I'll find a word from him every day just in reading the Bible, maybe several. The other one's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit emphasizes things. He takes things in the Bible. He makes them come to life. He helps us understand circumstances and issues that we run into. Over and over, the Holy Spirit is talking to us about what the Father's wanting to say. So between the Bible and the Holy Spirit, those are the two keys about hearing. So if God is speaking, the question could be asked, are we listening? If I said earlier, the radio signals are in this room, are you listening? You'd say, no, my receiver's not turned on. So why aren't our receivers on? We don't realize how much God wants to speak to us. In the Old Testament, it was hard to hear from God. Prophets, priests, and kings could occasionally hear. In the New Testament, with the work of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary, he split the temple, had a veil that hid what was called the Holy of Holies. Nobody could go in there but the priest once a year. He tore that veil in two, opened it up, and said, from now on, my presence is going to be available on an ongoing basis to anybody who wants it. In fact, to show you how contemporary our God is, he took the Holy of Holies. You know what he did with it? He took it out of a building in a far country and stuck it inside of each one of you and made you into a mobile app. All right? And you guys thought that Google and those guys figured out mobile apps. They're just copying what the Lord did. Every one of us is the presence and power the voice of Christ right where we're sent. And if you get that, it'll change your life. That line alone will, will change your life. I often uh, jokingly call myself a, a pinball. Uh, how many of you ever played a pinball machine? Some of you old timers, you understand what I'm talking about. The rest of you just be envious. We don't know how to play your video games. Pinball, you have this little thing, a pull lever back, and a little ball goes up and bounces around, and the more it bounces, the more points you get. Life is like that ball. You, you shot out that little lever. You hit an event. If you hear from God, you bounce to the next one well, and you just keep scoring points. If you don't hear from God, what happens? The dreaded drain word. The ball just drains right out the bottom. You have to start over. So just think of that. Every time that, that you're uh, uh, playing pinball, this is my, my life is. So some of you get hooked on it. Well, if you're going to learn to listen... It starts with a heart that hungers after God. This is really important, a heart for God. Do you know that over 10 times Jesus says in the Gospels or in the first few book, uh, chapters of the book, Revelation, if you have ears, let him hear. Turn to the person next to you and see if they have ears. Most everybody has ears in here, right? I know there's a few deaf people for which uh, I wish there weren't, but Jesus obviously isn't saying if you have ears, that are stuck it out. He's saying if you have the ability to really hear what I'm saying, you'll get it. I ran across the verse in my daily reading that one of my new favorite verses, it's hard to become one of my new favorites. I only have about 200 of them. But um, Proverbs 20, verse 12 in the Passion Translation says this, lovers of God have been given eyes to see and ears to hear from, from God. Isn't that powerful? Lovers of God have been given eyes to see and ears to hear from God. Wow. So if you're not hearing, I would ask two questions. Am I a lover of God? And would God agree that I'm a lover of him? If not, go to work on it. 
and it'll, it'll make a difference. I was, I was looking into this a little closer and I came across Andrew Womack had written a recent article on why people don't hear from God. He gave two, two things. Number one, he said, our receivers are broken. We're either getting too much static, too much um, noise is in the system or we're just not even tuning in. So that's one. He said, number two, he thinks most people don't realize that most of what God says to us is our own thoughts and voice working up within us. And a lot of people... A lot of people will say, I just made that up. Through technology, uh, I'm in a book study with people from Mongolia. It's hard to imagine it, it, it's possible. Mongolia is above China and kind of tucked into part of Russia toward the eastern side. It, it's hard to get there. But through technology, we have a Zoom call every two weeks with the help of Yu Yu Li, who is our missionary to Asia, and she connected with these people, and they liked Diane's book, Hello, Holy Spirit, so we're discussing it. And a young girl asked the question. She said, I want to hear from God, but I think they're all my thoughts. Here's a key. I don't have an exact answer, but here's a key. As you get closer to God, your thoughts and God's thoughts start to merge. Okay? As they merge, they're going to be more and more. Your thoughts are now speaking his words. See, as we become more and more like him, our thoughts. So if the thought that comes up in your heart is good, godly, kingdom-oriented, do it. Assume God just spoke. Give him the credit. God just gave me an idea. Or I think God gave me an idea and try it. See what happens. Doesn't work? Um, you know, I guess you can blame God, right? No, I wouldn't blame God. I'd just say you weren't hearing so well. But seriously, I think that's really important. So if you're going to prepare your heart, Get in your Bible. Your Bible is the common language God speaks through. Take some time to know that language. Know who God is, that he's the great and awesome being, the one who I say is um, bigger, better, and more beautiful than you ever dreamed. And then get to know who you are. I still hear people uh, telling God said things to them from the old covenant. No, God speaks in new covenant language because the old covenant was obsolete. Okay? Okay. Remember that. So if you're starting to hear old covenant things, just put them aside. For now, it doesn't mean that God can't get principles out of the old covenant, but he, he's going to speak to you things that happened since the cross, where you're headed, where you're going. And I think that if you do that, you'll, you'll find yourself really, really uh, starting to hear from God. So when I'm doing this, I'm paying attention. What am I reading? What am I hearing? What's coming toward me? What circumstances are involved in my life? Have I had any dreams lately? Did anybody say any spiritual gifts to me? Did anybody prophesy over me? Is there anything happening that I need to pay attention to? What thoughts have I had? Sometimes these come up in prayer and fasting. For me, I, I tend to get less when I, when I pray and fast. That doesn't mean I don't do it. I don't tend to hear the things I'm praying and fasting for. That's just me. Other people say, no, I get it all the time when I pray and fast. I get it more at random times. I'll be in the shower, mowing the yard. The other day, Diane and I were walking around the neighborhood, and we got a bunch of new people moving into our neighborhood, and I felt the Lord said, you need to start paying attention to this neighborhood because I've brought new people, and it's open. There's a new opening. When people move, by the way, they're much more open to the gospel than if they've lived in the same house for a long time. That's a secret. I'm giving it to you for free. Just throw things in every now and then. Listen closely. Miss a statement, miss a lot, right? Okay. I got that from the newspaper. Um, <laughs> seriously, though, we no sooner said that. The next day, a newcomer, we're walking around. She said, now, you got to come in and look at my house. I'm painting it. So she already began to receive us. We didn't lead her to the Lord, and it's going to be an interesting project uh, from that day. But again, that's what we're, I'm talking about. You're always listening. Give expression to the little impressions that you get. I was starting to get an impression that I was supposed to open up my neighbor, neighbors. Invite them over. Serve them. Talk to them. Uh, get involved in their lives. Take my own life. I, I'm 73. What am I supposed to do? A few years ago, we turned the church over to Mike and Julie as the senior leaders, and we said, we'll be pastors, but just not on the top role. Because people think I'm retired, and I think, this doesn't feel like retired. This feels like I got a lot of gas left in the tank, but how do I use what I have? I want to be fruitful to the end. 
have had hundreds of words saying, there's lots left for you to do. Do this, do that. So I put them all together, and it came up with, I'm to be an apostolic father to many of you, raise you up, and help you become all you were meant to be. I've gotten to do it, so now my job is to turn around and give it back, pay it back. A lot's been poured into me. I want to pour it into you to see you become the people God called you to do so that someday you can pour it into another generation, to another generation, and this thing will continue. And so it, it, it's exciting when God speaks to you and he gives you clarity. Now, what if you do hear something? I'm talking about, I'm not talking about what you're going to have for breakfast or what route you took to church or something like that. You can figure that out. God gives you wisdom. But how about a new career? What uh, curriculum in college, or what uh, core issues should I study in college? Where should I live? Where do I go to church? Who should I have for a life partner? You know, what house should I buy? How, when you hear something like that, my advice is just stay calm, stay slow, work it out little at a time. Ask God for more confirmation. Ask God for direction. Ask God for uh, wise people. Go to wise people. Ask them what to do. Years ago, Diane and I heard a line from one of our mentors, and he said, hurry rush is of the devil. You should write that down. Hurry rush is of the devil. Now, God may occasionally say, stop it, and he means it right now, okay? I understand that. But I'm talking about the average situation. Where, what house you're going to buy? He doesn't probably tell you. You got to buy that house in 30 seconds. Take your time. Ask some people. Hurry rushes of the devil. God's always moving, but he said his yoke is easy, his burden is light. He's having a good time, and he's not all flustered about anything. We are, but he's not. Okay, so just take your time. Ask some older people, what should I do here? Get some advice. It may not be, but the process of getting advice will help you hear more clearly. Don't be afraid to work through some of the issues. Okay, assuming that you believe in a speaking God, assuming you've prepared your heart, assuming you've got some language for him to talk to, now you've heard something. What should you expect? You should expect good things for yourself, for the people you're speaking to. I'll give you a story uh, of John Wimber. He's the guy who founded the vineyard. Years ago, he was working with the Righteous Brothers, the rock and roll group. He was living a worldly lifestyle. He meets a Quaker. The Quaker leads him to the Lord. He eventually becomes the pastor of a 3,000-member Quaker church. He's doing quite well. He leaves that job and becomes a consultant for a big seminary in Southern California, Fuller Seminary, and he's talking to thousands of pastors and hundreds of churches, and he's worn out. One day he's lying on a hotel uh, bedroom, and, uh, on the bed on a, in a hotel room, and he says, Lord, I'm tired. And the Lord says, okay, John, you've seen what you can do. Now do you want to see what I can do? Write that statement down. That's another good one. John said, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. What do you want to do? His obedience allowed him to start the Vineyard Movement. It has 3,000 churches worldwide. Changed how Christians live their faith out and how they express it in worship and ministry. And has millions of people around the world that say, John Wimber influenced me. That's one man who didn't know God from a beanpole and suddenly he's changing the world. Why? He heard God. I was, you know, amen. It's, it's a great story. I was in a business meeting not long ago, and I'm listening and hearing, and I'm starting to hear God say, I really want to bless this company. I have a word for you to give to them. This is a business meeting. We, we're not talking, the Bible's not anywhere to be seen. Doesn't mean we're not Christians, but... I'm hearing God wants to bless the company, expand it, take it into a prosperous era, and he's really wants to confirm something. I tell the leader who happens to own the place, and I said, this is what the Lord's saying. He looked at me with a big smile. I said, that's what God's been telling me. Now, what happened there? That's a confirmation to hearing before, and when you get a confirmation, your faith just went from here to here. Because I didn't know anything about what God had told him. Now I tell him. This morning in the first service, when I told the thing about reaching the neighborhood, somebody came up to me, and they said, we don't live far from you, and God told me the same thing about my part of the neighborhood. And she said she'd had three confirmations before I said this one. This was her fourth. She said, I think I got some work to do. You see how it works? God wants to give, he wants to give you some assurance. 
See, again, we have a great, great shepherd. What do you think shepherds want to do? Psalm 23, the Lord is our shepherd. He wants good things for you. Start your morning out like that. Holy Spirit, what are we going to do today? Because the shepherd's going to do some neat things for me today. What are we doing? Ask him. He talks. It's an amazing story. I want to close this out with a story that is really near and dear to our campuses. We have this campus and one in Sullivan. It's the story of how David and Olivia Woodrow became David's the worship leader at Sullivan. That's a picture of David and Olivia. And I want to share how God spoke this person into being on our staff. This is interesting. Over the last few months, we had some pastors go other places. God called them elsewhere. That's fine. That's a natural part of life. Uh, kids grow up, they leave the nest. You know how that works. And they sometimes leave the nest. There's some issue. Well, I won't go there. But um, I was praying one morning, and I felt the Lord said, here's a person from another state that you should ask to be a pastor. I told Mike and Julie, who did their homework and talked to the person, and, and um, it, it was progressing okay. Meanwhile, uh, that person happened to be a friend of David Woodrow, and David was about to get married, so he invited him to his bachelor party. And then the guy says, hey, I'm talking to the Sullivan Vineyard about maybe being an associate pastor, and they need a worship pastor. Now, this is right during the marriage. Anybody's getting married. They're not thinking about a job, but he thought about it. He did a Zoom interview before the wedding, one after the wedding. He uh, was, um, as time went on, he said, I don't even know where Solomon is. I better check and see if they have at least a McDonald's and an IGA store. They did. They passed. And so he, he proceeded. He felt the Holy Spirit nudging him to apply. And then as a confirmation, he's reading his Bible one day and he hears God tell Abraham in Genesis 12, leave it all behind, your native land, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I'll show you. David and Olivia said, that, that must be God. They accepted Everybody is delighted. He's doing an amazing job down there. We're really proud to have David and Olivia on the team. Now, let's go back a moment. I heard a word that started the ball rolling, but that guy eventually pulled out because he said, the time's not right for me to move. Meanwhile, God used that guy to tell David there's a job. The Spirit began to nudge David to apply. Circumstances were looking good because he found us. A IGA store and a McDonald's and then he reads a passage did God speak to him right through the list he said yes you see how it works so it's important that you give words receive words process words all that and it'll be really really important as you go along remember God is a speaking God. In fact, in 1977, God asked me to pastor this church, and I said, I can't do it. He said, I'll make you a promise. If you will do it, I'll send you every person you ever need. Mike and Julie happened to know that promise, so they latched onto it and claimed it. It came through once again. The person we needed, God gave us. Isn't God good? He wants to do that for you. He wants to speak to you, talk to you, give you what you need. Let's apply this this week. I want you to do something for me. This week, I want you to listen to what God speaks. When you're reading your Bible, you're praying, you're walking around, whatever you're doing, write it down, a word for yourself. Next week, I want you to write another word for yourself and a word for somebody else, I want you to share it. I want you to send me a testimony by email of how it went. I love reading how you talk to people and how you share things. And it's really good to have the flock talking to each other because we're, we're helpful to each other. All right, let me summarize. God is a speaking God. He wants to talk. He's talking all the time. I think you want to listen. You're here. I think that's what you're here for. So we need to learn how to do it. The Spirit and the Bible will be the best two tools I, I know of. And there's wonderful fruit. But remember, God's only going to speak good things that'll help you grow into that champion that he wants you to be. Remember, I wanted my sheep to be champions. He wants you to be a champion in the spirit. He wants you to grow up to be all that he created you to be. It's exciting. It's a great promise. And I think that if you follow after it, you'll be shocked at how your life will change. God bless you as you pursue it. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, you're just the best.
Thank you, thank you, thank you for all the things you've given us. Lord, teach us how to hear your voice, how to walk with you, and how to know what you're doing all the time. In Jesus' name, amen.